Welcome, dearest viewer, to the Quintilian Institute once again. Spring has sprung, and we have a vernal crop of venerable words about words that could even please songbirds, because this terrific tetralogy of terms all concern themselves with the sonorous side of language. Today, that is, we're talking about words and the sounds they make. But before we do, the Quintilian Institute research staff has asked that I share this brief informational video with you. The syllable. Some words have many, some words have few, but all words have at least one. What is a syllable, you ask? Well, it's a grouping of sounds. In fact, here's one now. Well, actually, this is the one-syllable word sleds, but here are the sounds that make up this syllable. Now that we have a set of sounds, we can see how syllables are built. Every syllable has a nucleus, which is most often a vowel. Consonants may appear before or after the nucleus. Those that appear before the nucleus are known as the onset. Those that appear after are known as the coda. And together, the nucleus and coda are called the rhyme. And yes, that is foreshadowing. So now, if you're ever in a dire emergency and need to tell someone what a syllable is made of, you can. And it's all thanks to your friends at the Quintilian Institute of Words About Words. Well, now that we have a good understanding of syllables under our belt, I suppose it's time to start at the beginning, or one might even say at the onset. When you have a series of syllables, or words really, that all start with the same sound, then you have yourself a case of alliteration. It might be tempting to call this a repetition of the same letter at the beginning of each word, but it's important to remember that we're concerned with sound and not spelling. The phenomenally pretentious pterodactyl does not demonstrate alliteration but the possible improvement and expansion of public parks does. In the first, we do not have a repetition of sounds. In the second, not every word starts with the same letter, but most of the stressed syllables do start with the same sound. And of course, you can do alliteration with any consonant, and imaginary bonus points are available if you can prepare an alliterative string of syllables with multi-consonant onsets like the sleepy sloth slipped, sliding down the slick slopes until they slumped into the slush. Obviously, alliteration like this can be a little bit cartoonish, and it can be seen as a cheap trick or a shallow way of showing off. So a less sustained string of starting sounds may serve as a superior strategy. Sparing alliteration is less likely to be mocked and more likely to provide a subtle reinforcing effect. For example, in The Chocolatier touted her famous fudge and tremendous truffles, the little alliterative garnish serves the dual purposes of prettying up the prose and reinforcing the connections between the nouns and their modifiers. Not only do they go together, but they sound the same, doubling up on their structural unity and making the pairs more memorable. An equally useful and sometimes showy tool, rhyme has in some ways lost its battle with time, earning the suspicion of overly serious writers, and of course, I don't need to tell you why that's a crime. But rhyme, unsurprisingly, relies on repeated sounds that show up in the rhyme of a syllable, particularly in the last stressed syllable of a word. So dread rhymes with bread because the rhymes of both syllables sound the same, and subscribing and bribing both rhyme as well, and vibing makes that rhyming pair a trio. Don't get distracted by the onset R's, that's a red herring. But like alliteration, rhyme can often be conspicuous, and that conspicuousness can draw too much attention to the sounds and away from the message. Our brave modern age likes its prose plain, and rhyme can be a bit rich for those who fancy their palates discerning. But, but, it would be a real shame to overlook the value of tools like alliteration and rhyme. There's a very good reason that they're abundant in things like songs and poetry and age-old maxims. Used cheaply, the attention-grabbing powers of rhyme and alliteration can become mere distractions. Used thoughtfully, though, and they can reinforce messages and make writing more memorable. There's a reason sayings like a friend in need is a friend indeed and no pain no gain have stuck around, and I'm sure if you've ever tried to memorize a rhyming poem or song, you've found it much easier than trying to memorize a block of academic prose. The repeated sounds give your memory something else to hang on to. It's much easier to remember what the mouse ran up when you know that it has to rhyme with hickory dickory dock. And let's take a moment to appreciate that rhyme into alliteration operation. It's rather smooth. And that's the point. It's no accident that ancient texts are full of sound-based structures like rhyme, alliteration, and other things. Before writing was invented, memorizing texts was the only way to preserve them, and sound played an invaluable role in that. 
But for as useful and delightful as rhyme and alliteration might be, a subtle effect can be just as valuable as a dramatic one. So if you're looking for something a little less ostentatious, you might consider reaching for consonance or assonance. Assonance involves the repetition of vowel sounds, so you might consider it the nuclear option. Unlike rhyme, which requires a more exacting literary design, assonance finds its place alongside more serious writing. So while it's impossible to miss a rhyme, assonance may go unnoticed by most, but it will be cherished by the perceptive. So in a sentence like, we were sleeping on the beach when a warm breeze swept in over the sea, we get the repetition of a vowel sound. The assonance doesn't call much attention to itself, but it does build a quiet kind of music into the sentence. Compare it, for example, to we were lying on the sand when the breeze swept in over the ocean. It says the same thing, but it's missing something. Most people probably wouldn't care, but you can see how assonance makes the sentence sound more refined. And consonance works in a similar way. This time we're concerned with the repetition of consonant sounds, but with consonants that repetition appears in the codas of syllables. There at the back end of a syllable the repetition is less noticeable but that doesn't make it imperceptible. So maybe in a sentence like, the ocean waves crashed on the coast, pushing silt inland and then washing it back to the depths, you get the benefit of repeated consonants without the same risk of cartoonishness that alliteration might pose. And of course, in this case, we get the repetition of shh, a very oceanic sound. Yes, even writing can have good sound effects and consonants and assonants can be ways of making that happen without going over the top. So you see, there's all manner of fun to be had with the sounds of language. You can dial them up with rhyme or alliteration or downplay them with consonants and assonance. But never ignore them because they can have a substantial impact on the way that your audiences read and remember what you have to say. Now, I can only encourage you to go out and have some fun with sound, experiment, play around, and share your best with us below. And I suppose it would make as much sense to solicit your subscription as it would to lean on your largesse and plead for a like. It is, as always, up to you, but the benefits to the Institute are immeasurable. Of course, and as always, thanks for joining us today. Be well until we meet again. Am I supposed to be pleased by this prank? Of course, I'd prefer not to have a parcel on my porch packed with pounds of, please, pickled peppers, and postmarked no less to some preposterous Peter surnamed Piper. How do you propose I solve this problem? An ounce of prevention would have been permissible, but now, my companion, you find yourself pleading for my pardon when you might have paused and asked permission first. It's pitiful.